Hilary Couchman, Dr. Hilary Couchman. How long have you been swearing? Well, curse words or vulgarities go back really as far as language itself, but when it comes to written English, we find profanities cropping up from the 13th century. So, something like this, should I wear gloves to... The this? protocol is that the curator handles the material. Oh, okay, right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen Dr. David Starkey handling stuff like this on TV. And I've even seen them let Tony Robinson have a fiddle. The protocol is the curator handles the material. Well, you said that. Do they ever let you guys go to an area just to relax? Because they, they should do. Maybe that should be part of the protocol. Swearing, swear words. One of the more prominent words is the word f But c too is also common across the Germanic and Scandinavian languages. Yeah. We also find uses of p c c well, well, what, what, where, where, what areas would these profanities emanate from? I'm thinking Manchester, Liverpool. No, from across the whole country. OK. Now, what we have here are parish records from Drayton in Shropshire. Uh, where would that be? 1295. That's what these trousers cost. So, what these documents show is how the earliest instances of swear words were typically found in the names of places or people. Mm -hmm. So, surnames often describe what someone was or did. Right. Here we have a listing for um, Henry f**k a beggar. Goodness me. Now, back then, the word f**k didn't have its current meaning. Okay. It actually referred to hitting or striking. Right, good. Uh, well, hence the phrase, let's hire some Albanians to f**k him up. So there are terms that have fallen out of use. So here in 1740, uh, we have the term rantalian, oh, which means one word. whose scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. One wonders whether that's due to a truncated member or a distended testes. Well, I guess it's just chicken and egg. Um, we also find some fairly vulgar slang words for penis, such as beard splitter uh -huh. and arse opener. Whilst fellatio was known as bagpiping. Oh, makes sense. In the 1785 book, The Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, uh -huh. we find the term to huffle. Would you like to have a guess at what that means? Oh, gosh, I'll have a bash. Um... Uh, to huffle um, the act of putting my head between a lady's breasts and uh, huffling. Uh, that's, you get the picture. No, it's, it's another word to fillet. <laughs> right, OK. I always find it amusing uh, when I ask people that question, what answer I'll get. <laughs> right, well, that's an interesting part of the protocol. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hilary Mantel. Couchman. Well, one who likes to squat over. Another... It's my surname. Right, yes, of course. London, the year 2023, and leather-clad renegade Nero Costa is on the run. With the police now able to detect wrongdoing before it's happened by accessing our brains over Wi-Fi for signs of thought crime, police are able to apprehend so-called plea criminals without trial. My character, Nero Costa, is wanted for the murder of a politician he has yet to even meet. The stuff there of some dystopian sci-fi movie, currently seeking seed finance and a distributor. In real life, though, with the thought police confined to the Guardian's comment pages, we rely on mass imprisonment to curb crime. But some criminal justice campaigners even take issue with that. Why? Well, in 1971, researchers at Stanford University conducted a prison experiment in which volunteers were given roles as inmates or guards. Within days, the guards had become sadistic and cruel, the prisoners servile and weak, a power dynamic familiar to anyone who stayed with their wife's parents at Christmas. I have personal experience of the kind of damage the Stanford experiment can cause. In 2004, I'm ashamed to say that I took part in a Channel 4 rehash named Loose Screws. If you ever want to see your kids again, you better start showing some respect! Right, who's next? The series was never broadcast. Where's Vernon? Academics pour scorn on our prisons from the comfort of their leather big chairs. But how many have ever been in a prison? None. Whereas I've come to sample a bit of porridge first-hand. Not the kind I have for breakfast. Organic oats, linseed, sliced nana, all washed down with piping hot coffee and my tablets. But the Hello? Ca it's Alan Partridge, I've got permission. 
But the kind of porridge served at Her Majesty's pleasure, but the only piping hot coffee is the hot coffee thrown in your face by a troubled teenager with a rubbish dad. That's right, Borstal. Tissue, item, semi-used, access key, insignia with leather toggle. Chicken shop wet wipes, five units. I didn't want to go to a men's prison, but seeing as the women's prison didn't get back to me, I would be incarcerated here in a youth offenders institute. For the homeless. And the gloves? Why? To kick off, I spent what seemed like an hour with prison governor Morris Pelt. It's about carrots and stick, isn't it? Uh, although you, know, you can hit people with a carrot. He said the boys nicknamed him Strange Ways because he used to work there. But I'll let you be the judge. When these young lads walk through these doors and become inmates, I stand them where you are now and I say, what? You blew it, kid. I say, forget what might have been. Three words, Alan. Three words that are banned in my office. Shoulda, woulda. Coulda, shoulda done this, shoulda done that. You didn't. Coulda done this, coulda done that. You didn't. Woulda done this, woulda done that. You didn't. No, you didn't. I liked Morris. His inspirational shtick could be a little preachy, honed by Sunday morning spent as a Christian minister. But if he thinks we have a soul inside us, like some sort of holy spleen, where's the harm in that? Because you know what the prize is, huh? It's the future. What's the prize? The future. Wrong, no. Not the future, a future. There's a boy's eye. Because changing direction is a choice. But whose choice? Mine. It slowly dawned on me Yours. Morris was asking questions he knew he and I both knew the answers to, which felt like cheating. Then again, although a bit simplistic for the likes of me, Where is it? behind you. It was perfect for daft lads. Why are clean hands important? because humans are the most effective incubators of bacteria outside of imported meat. A fact first discovered 150 years ago in Soho, when its filthy reputation was based not on pole dancers from Lapland, or lap dancers from Poland, Poland, but because of an outbreak of cholera. Imagine going into a newsagent and ordering not a can of Coca-Cola, but a can of Coca-Cola. That's effectively what the Soho residents were doing in 1854 when they came to draw water from this pump to sate, slake or quench their thirst. That was before the physician John Snow discovered that the disease was spread through contaminated water. And this paved the way for the invention of antibiotics, a remedy against bacteria that initially seemed infallible. I said initially slightly louder because Whilst antibiotics once stopped bacteria like these from breeding like randy Catholic rabbits, their prophylactic power has become dulled through overuse. Many liken antibiotics to giving a box of chocolates to an angry spouse. The first time the chocolates will overwhelm the wife and quell her ire completely. The sixth, seventh time, the chocolates still subdue the miffed woman, but less than they had earlier. And by the twentieth time, the chocolates have little to no potency and can even inflame the problem further. I was troubled by this. I knew more than ever before that we needed to wash our hands. Brown. But were we doing? To find out for myself, I've come to the gents' toilets at the BBC to conduct a study of my own. Hello, Alan Partridge, BBC. Uh, did you wash your hands? Yep. Good man. I've concentrated exclusively on the gents' loos. Uh, a man standing outside a women's lavatory can be seen as predatory. Equally, a man loitering outside a gentleman's toilet uh, can be fraught with ambiguity. So, uh, to put it on a more formal footing, I've got this woman with a clipboard. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Thera. Sarah. Thera. Sarah. Thera. Okay. The BBC employs some 20,000 people. Just write that down. And not all of them are going to wash their hands. Right, it is Thera. I thought, I thought you had a list. <laughs> no, it's Arabic. Okay. Menial workers, for example, are employed to pick up bits of dirt, and the likelihood of them ever being asked to shake hands with senior management are very low. Put them down as a no. Still, the results made for grim reading, with just 28% saying they washed their hands. Yeah, I'm going to wash my own hands later. <coughs> Swindon. And I've come to the British School of Hygiene to ask Professor Jean Chowdhury how clean hands can stop the spread of germs. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hi. Jean, hand washing. How often should we be washing them? 
Well, any time we come into contact with bacteria. So, um, after going to the toilet. Agreed. Uh, after handling raw meat. Right, and that's separate, isn't it? That's not a euphemism for the first one. No. Uh, raw meat can harbour some pretty nasty bacteria, so if in doubt, wash. And the advice from the World Health Organisation is that we should be washing our hands for a full 20 seconds. 15 is fine. Which is why there's actually an instructional video which shows exactly how to wash your hands. Mm. Yes, please. So we begin by rubbing the palms together, work up a nice creamy lather. Those are very creamy hands. And then you rub the back of your left hand with the right palm with interlaced fingers. Yeah. And same with the other hand. Yeah. And rinse with warm water. Yeah. Um, that's, those taps are the same as the ones over there. Oh, yeah, we shot it here. Well, so those are your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Ruth. Uh, sorry again for uh, the misunderstanding with your father. Water under the bridge. Yeah, it's just that I had not seen him in the studio before, and uh, the reason I said I thought I told you to wait in the car was because I mistook him for my Uber driver. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the, the picture they show on the app, it, it's quite small. To be honest, I quite enjoyed watching you squirm. Hi, Irene. <laughs> she never gives me a bloody inch, this one. Going live in five, four. Welcome back. Now, as part of our crackdown on crime season, today we're looking at punishment. Yesterday, we heard your views on the return of flogging. But today, is mass imprisonment still good policy? Ruth Duggan joins us to tell us about a very different approach. That's right, Jenny, because for the last 24 hours, Alan has been wearing an electronic tag. <laughs> Voluntarily, I should add. Yes, you should, if you don't mind. Sorry, wouldn't want to cast you in a bad light. <laughs> yeah, don't do that, we'll get letters. Yeah, seriously, some people just don't like it. So, Ruth, tell us about the tag. How does it work? So, tags allow probation services to monitor compliance with home detention curfews. So Essentially, if you aren't home when you're meant to be, it raises the alarm. Uh, not quite right. OK. The latest tags, like the one you wore, monitor all of an offender's movements 24-7 using GPS. Right, I see. I, I thought you told me... Allowing us to track all their movements in real time or call up anywhere they've been over the last 24 hours. Wow. Right. Something civil liberties groups might well take issue with. Yes. So this is your movement map for the 24 Ooh. hours that you wore it. OK. And we can see that you made a few excursions during the day, starting with a trip to a swimming pool between 10 and 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. Put it in a few lengths. Well, we know from the pool's website that it was water aerobics from 10 till 11. Yes, this week I did do that. Then there was a visit to Svensson Cosmetic Solutions. Is that a clinic? You were there for an hour just after 2 p.m. No idea. Well, we know you were. No idea. But it was you who went there. You don't remember? Nothing. It was yesterday, Alan. That's something a probation officer might flag. Hair clinic? Likewise, your next stop, a visit to a clothes shop. Ah, yes. Uh, McGovern's of Norwich, uh, gentlemen's outfitters. They, they made me a pair of twill pleated notchback trousers for the Goodwood Revival Festival, which I needed to get fitted with an elastic waist. Uh, I'm afraid when it comes to my uh, battle with, the, with my waistline, I'm, I'm waving the white flag. Not too self-conscious to admit that, you know, which proves I wasn't trying to conceal anything earlier. You went back and forth to the gents' outfitters 16 times. That's correct. Which, again, a probation officer would query, as it might imply, illicit activity. Or, or even indicate mental health issues. Could do. I mean, I do ten Sudokus a week, but, yeah, could do. Well, you can see how it looks odd. <laughs> Not really. I went to town to drop my trousers off, then it started raining, so I ran home, and then I remembered I'd driven into town, so I ran back to the car park for my car, but realised I'd left my parking ticket at home. So I went back home to get my parking ticket, but couldn't get in because I left my house keys in the car. So I walked back to the car, got the house keys, walked back home, went in, got the parking ticket, walked back into town for the car and drove it back home. Then McGovern's uh, called to say my trousers were ready. So I drove back into town, got the trousers, but I realised I'd left my wallet at home so I, I couldn't leave the car park again. Walked home, got my wallet, then walked back to get my car, but I left my car keys at home. So then I walked back uh, to the car and drove home. Then I realised McGovern's had given me the wrong trousers, so I drove back to town, swapped them for the right ones before walking home. That means you left your car. Forget the car. I'm not bothered about the car. I was in pain. My scalp was bleeding. Ruth Duggan, thank you very much. You're welcome. As the Dalai Lama says, the show must go on.
Uh, yeah, you cock a snook at bad news, don't you? I, I do, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm a snook cocker. I'm sure there's an anagram in there somewhere. What? Huh? Hmm? Hmm? Just, I'm just saying, I'm sure there's an anagram in there somewhere. Oh. Doesn't matter. Press on. Introduce your next guest. Calling me that? Not an anagram. Simon Denton there. Funny Simon Denton. Yes. What's fascinating about history is that, unlike bread in a bakery or love in a marriage, it's never going to run out. But military history is a genre all of its own. A new series promises to shed light on battlefield ingenuity, and we'll be talking to its presenter, Sam Chatwin, very shortly. Hello. Shortly. But first, since military history is a subject close to my heart, I thought I'd don my wellies and shed a bit of light on one of my favourite battles. Let's take a look at my report. A simple stream in North Walsham, Norfolk. But six centuries ago, this stream would have flowed with the blood and entrails of fallen men. I was hoping to illustrate it by pouring in this bucket of butcher's waste. But some Dilbert at the council seems to think it would contaminate the water supply. So close your eyes instead and imagine bits of dead men bobbing about in red water. This was the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, caused, some say, by underpaying the workers. But there's compelling evidence that low wages actually increases productivity. As Kirsty Allsop says, a well-fed dog is a slow dog. Whatever the pros and cons, there can be no excuse for the peasants' antisocial behaviour. The execution of their ringleaders serving as a timely reminder that laws are there for a reason. Behind me is North Walsham Heath. What today is a pleasant place to rest was once a peasant place of rest, since many of them lay dying here. You see, razzed up on scrumpy and injustice, they brought to the battle only guts and aggression. And as anyone who's played squash against Adrian Childs will tell you, guts and aggression are no match for skill and tactics, unless his opponents had a big breakfast. The battle was bloody. After the first day, the bishop's men set up camp here on the heath, a place for the pooped troops to regroup and recoup. They would have discussed the tactics with the free hot meal included. There were potatoes in those days, of course, they hadn't been developed. It was simply lamb shank or the classic chicken. In contrast, one can picture the peasants loaded on cider, weeing into bushes, telling disgusting jokes before attacking the bishop's men in dawn raids. But the lack of organisation meant they were no match for the deft swordsmanship and combat nurse of a trained unit. <laughs> the labourers were serfs, their hands more used to drawing milk from a goat teat than wielding a sword. The trained soldiers knew to have one hand on the hilt, the other on the pommel. That is what I do. <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> Continued. The bishop's men fighting off futile frenzy and sometimes rubbish attacks from the peasants. The battle continued till dusk. The last of the rebels dispatched had a bloody defeat that could have been avoided if the peasants had simply raised their concerns through the correct channels. A sobering reminder that war, be it the First World War, the Second World War, or the Great War of China, always takes a heavy toll. We've been fighting. And I was the winner. 